Well, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that we can have the truth, Lord, in the world that's just filled with lies, Lord. Everywhere you look, it's, I, I, we can see through them, Lord. We can, we can see that this is a lie, Lord, but what is the truth at the bottom of everything, God? One lie just undergirded by another lie, and whether it's a government, Lord, and Democrat, Republican, doesn't matter, Lord. They're just they're liars, Lord. And the, the news media, Lord, social media, whatever. Lord, please, just fill us with your Holy Spirit and, and use your word, Lord, to provide a filter for us, God, as we go out into this world. As Peter said, a light in a dark world. May that be what your word is for us, Lord. As we study it here today, Lord, speak to us. We pray your Holy Spirit would be the teacher and you administer to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to finish up Hebrews today and we'll pick up chapter 13, verse 1. The writer said, Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Marriage is honorable among all the bed undefiled, but fornicators, adulterers, God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. As I pointed out last time, the bulk of this letter to the Hebrews, it's an appeal to first century Jewish Christians to not revert back to practicing Judaism. The benefit for us in this epistle, and all these New Testament epistles, you think if these people didn't have problems, you know, we wouldn't have anything to read. We wouldn't have anything to learn from. So we benefit from this epistle specifically, all the in-depth instruction that the author gives them regarding our Lord Jesus Christ, especially from an Old Testament Hebrew perspective. Beginning, as we saw in this epistle with his the Lord's equality with God the Father. Then there's a whole section on the Lord's superiority over angels, his role as our great high priest, his fulfillment of the Levitical temple worship system, and his superior once-for-all sacrifice. All along, the writer has been including applications to these theological points that he's making, very important encouragements on how to respond to the things being taught about the Lord. Encouragements such as, let us therefore be diligent to enter our spiritual rest, or let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Let us draw near with a true heart full assurance. Let us have our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. As we saw last time, chapter 12, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably. Now, these and others, very important spiritual disciplines that I receive, I practice, I walk in by faith, I am strengthened in them through prayer then and my study of God's word through fellowshipping with like-minded believers. But thankfully, it's not just left at that because I don't know about anyone else, but diligently entering spiritual rest for me is an abstract concept. Coming boldly to an invisible throne of grace it can be a little challenging to have my heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. I can read that as an unbelief. What do I go to a cardiologist? You know, <laughs> how do I have my heart sprinkled? I got to have surgery or something? How, is this, how does this work? These are all important spiritual applications, but on their own, they're intangible concepts in figurative language. God's throne of grace is not a physical chair someplace. I can have you know, measles, I can have a headache, but how do I have grace by which to serve God acceptably? How do I put skin, so to speak, on these abstract concepts? That's where chapter 13 comes in. Loving my brothers and sisters, entertaining strangers, remembering prisoners, those types of things are more practical. Not that they're any easier much of them, but they're not just spiritual concepts presented in figurative language. 
and it's as I put into practice the practical applications that are presented in scripture like this, it's as I do that, that the more abstract spiritual applications, now they begin to make more and more sense. And so chapter 13 gives practical application to the previous spiritual applications. I can't have one without the other. Both need to be working in harmony if I'm going to be growing in my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot of people, they have the spiritual concepts down. Dude. They're great theologians and everything, but there's no practical application. They sit behind a desk and they pontificate on the internet. There's others are very active in practical service, but they fail to grow spiritually. They don't understand the, the theology behind what they're doing. And this final section begins here with several interpersonal relationships. To say, let brotherly love continue. Brotherly love is the Greek word Philadelphia. The Greek language very precise. You know, thankfully, the original language of the New Testament is not English. Because English on its own can be very vague, especially when you start adding slang and everything else that English incorporates. The Greeks are very precise, dude. They had multiple words for love, agape, phileo, storge, eros. All of them are translated love in the, in the English in our, in our Bible. But see, I love my wife, and I love jalapenos on my pizza, and I love the Three Stooges. But hopefully I don't love my wife like I love the Three Stooges. You know, <laughs> that'd be a problem. Now, eros is a Greek word from which we get the word erotic. It speaks of sexual love. Storge refers to the love that a parent has for a child or a child for a parent, familial love. Agape is the most powerful Greek word for love in the New Testament. It is the love that God has for us. And the love that I am to aspire to as a believer, as I relate to others. Agape is unconditional love, loving the unlovable, even loving my enemies and those who treat me bad. Agape is not about feelings. It is about a choice. I choose to love because my Lord tells me to love them. Even as he loves me, which he loved me when I was a blasphemer and a vulgar man and taking his name in vain every other second. But Romans 5, 8 says God demonstrates his love for us in that when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He made the first move and extends that hand of grace. The love spoken here in verse 1 is brotherly love. Philadelphia, it's a fourth Greek word. It's the highest form of friendship. How Christians are to love as brothers and sisters. It's a basis for the supernatural fellowship that we enjoy as followers of Jesus Christ. It was prevailing among these Hebrew believers, but the indication in this admonishment to let it continue, that is speaking of a danger existing of such mutual love being diminished and diminishing. Were they to break fellowship with one another, go back to Judaism, that brotherly love they shared as believers would be lost. A new commandment I give to you, Jesus said in John 13, 34 that you love one another as I have loved you, so too you are to also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. He says a new commandment. In other words, it was not a commandment included in the Mosaic law. It's why the Pharisees could despise Galilean Jews and in their mind think they're still keeping the law. But that's not how it is with believers. We are to love, and such love is to be continuous among us as Christian brothers and sisters. Let it continue or let it be continuous. Do not forget, verse 2 says, to entertain strangers. For by doing so, some have been unwittingly entertain angels. Now this is interesting coming right after verse 1. Don't forget to be hospitable to strangers. Don't get so wrapped up in your own little group with your continuous love that you're oblivious to somebody new standing there. I don't know about 
how it is with you. I get to church, and many times, you know, it's the only time I get to see my brothers and sisters. I want to just hang out. I want to catch up on how they're doing. You know, we start a conversation. We can be laughing, having a great time. And somebody new could walk in or somebody just visiting. And it's easy to not notice. Actually, it's easy to not care. That's why a command like this is given. And to not forget to include those who are strangers to our church body here. The word entertain, it doesn't mean I'm tap dancing and singing for them. You know, the Greek word means to receive them as a guest. Show hospitality. It can take discipline for some people to step outside of their comfort zone and reach out to somebody they don't know. To just be hospitable. It's why I need to seek grace in conjunction with many of these things. And some of us, we come early and we pray that the Lord will make us aware. Lord, make us see these people. Give me eyes to see. Make me hospitable. Make us servants, not just socialites. There's nothing wrong with enjoying fellowship. But I know, you know how awkward it can be. You enter a new place, you don't know anybody. <laughs> And I never want to forget that because, as verse 2 says, some have unwittingly entertained angels. In being hospitable in this way, some, without even knowing it, have received a divine messenger, is what this is saying. The word angel, angelos, in Greek, it's literally messenger. The gist of this exhortation is really that I can miss out on receiving a divine interaction, a divinely sent blessing by failing to recognize such opportunities that are presented to me or failing to act on them. Now, sometimes I have wondered about this over the years, in 25 years of ministry, and I think back and I think of all the times over the years when somebody shows up one time to church and I end up really getting blessed talking with them, encouraged after speaking with them. They leave, you know, I'm all built up. Man, that was an awesome brother, sister, whatever it was. And then I never see him again. I mean, maybe it was my breath, dude. Maybe I'd be old, dude. I don't know uh, what it is, you know. Or maybe they were a messenger sent by the Lord to encourage me that day. God may have sent a message and go minister to this guy. He needs some encouragement. Just go there and, you know, what if I just ignore him? They go back to God, they shrug their shoulder. Well, they didn't even acknowledge me. You know? <laughs> According to this, it is an opportunity that can be mass missed out on. Don't miss out. Another encouragement here, verse 3, remember the prisoners as if chained with them. Those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Now, this is a furthering of the initial let brotherly love continue statement. These are various examples and extensions of that. In the context of an epistle being written to believers who were under persecution, the imprisonment and mistreatment being spoken of in verse 3 would be speaking of specific incidences of persecution. People were being put in prison for their faith in Jesus Christ. Peter, James, John, the Apostle Paul, they're just the ones that we see mentioned in the Bible. Thousands more were being imprisoned for the gospel in that day. The mistreatment speaks of the physical beatings that believers would receive. And you also see that in the book of Acts. Remember the prisoners as though it were you that were locked up you know, and how encouraging it would be to have somebody from church come see you. Some with the, those, it's the same with those being mistreated because you are in the same spiritual body, congregation, a believer, the ability to sympathize with the brother's sister's physical affliction that keeps them away or they need some extra encouragement that should be relatable to me as a believer. There should be greater compassion. To remember, that is a verb that speaks of being mindful of their needs, or more importantly, being mindful that their needs are being taken care of. Being mindful, you know, well, I'll do it, you know. 
And God is faithful. Dear. I do a Monday night Bible study at a prison in Red Granite. I do a Tuesday afternoon Bible study at a prison in New Lisbon. And in each one, presently, there is a brother that had been coming to church before they got locked up. And each one, you know, at each of these Bible studies, asks about our church body. They ask about certain people. How's this guy doing? How are they doing? Those they fellowshiped with who ministered to them when they were here. I didn't set it up. You know, I just show up and just worked out that way. I'm able to bring an extension of our church body here into them and encourage them. And it's a real blessing. You get a greater appreciation for what we enjoy here when you visit those for whatever reason they want to come, but they can't attend. They're not, they're, they're not to be neglected. Call, write, visit, anything. Verse 4 says, Marriage is honorable among all in the bed undefiled, but fornicators, adulterers, God will judge. The emphasis in this verse is on the avoidance of sexual immorality within the body of Christ, keeping pure relationships. The way to achieve that is by highly esteeming God's institution of marriage. Marriage is to be held as honorable, something to be honored by all, it says. Biblically, God has ordained that marriage be the only relationship within which sexual expression is to take place. That's what sets it apart and brings honor to it. Satan, of course, he wants to dishonor marriage, he wants to pervert it, and he wants to make it nothing. Because from Genesis to Revelation, marriage is God's main institution in the Bible. That's why it is under such attack. And within the context of marriage, sexual expression is undefiled. There should be no inhibition. The purpose of sex is not just for reproduction, even though that's an aspect, nor is the purpose of sex just for pleasure, although that is another aspect. The purpose of sex is for the bonding together of a husband and wife as one flesh, Genesis 2.24. And through God's design and purpose, the greatest expression of sexual intimacy is experienced in that. All Satan can offer is a cheap substitute. And many people don't even realize they're getting ripped off. They're so deceived. Because the most intimate thing a husband and wife can engage in is prayer. And because of that, because the most intimate thing that a husband and wife can engage in is prayer, when that is the primary activity that a couple is engaged in, God ensures every other area of their relationship is blessed beyond measure. And only he can do that. Satan can't. See, most unbelievers are not growing together in a spiritual prayer life, usually. All the earthly, physical aspects of marriage can only take them so far. The spiritual relationship I have with the Lord, with my wife, being heirs together of the grace of life, 1 Peter 3, 7, that is endless. That just grows exponentially on into eternity. And thus, its effect on every other area of our relationship is endless as well, including sexual intimacy. An unbeliever will never know that. They can't. It's a spiritual relationship to begin with. It's not just physical. People think sex is just simply physical. It is not. It's a spiritual relationship. Fornicators, adulterers, God will judge, verse 4 says. Sexual activity outside of a marital commitment dishonors, defiles that which God has established to be holy and sacred. Fornication comes from a Greek word that speaks of any form of sexual activity outside of biblical marriage. Adultery is referring to someone who breaks the marriage bond sexually. Now, thankfully, Paul, the apostle, tells the Corinthian believers, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And that relates to the area of sexuality as well. 
by God's grace, believers do not have to carry the foolish behavior of our past around with us the rest of our lives. Some choose to. Some choose to carry it the rest of their life, dude, but they don't have to. Old things have passed away. All things have become new in Christ Jesus. Praise God. Let your conduct, he says in verse 5, be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. The writer concludes his primary thought of letting brotherly love continue with this duty that I have as a follower of Jesus Christ to not allow my conduct, my manner of living, to be ruled by covetousness. Again, this is included in the context of continuing in brotherly love. The Greek word for covetousness, phila argaros, is similar to Philadelphia, brotherly love. Phila argaros speaks of loving money or loving silver, literally. I got to love people more than I love money or stuff. And be content with such things as you have, he says. A contentment has nothing to do with possessions or finances or anything else I have or don't have. Contentment is a matter of the heart. The poor man is not the one who has little. The poor man is the person who wants much. They're going to be in poverty because they'll never get enough. Contentment will make a... a a run-down home look like a palace to anyone. I have learned in whatever state I am in to be content, Paul tells the Philippians, Philippians 4.11. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound, to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What freedom there is in a relationship with Jesus Christ. When the world owns me, it puts me in bondage, puts me in debt, puts me further in debt, holds me in bondage, no matter how much of it I have. When Jesus owns me, he sets me free, and whom the Son sets free is free indeed. The quote at the end of verse 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you, that is a promise God has made to many of his people throughout the Bible. It is a promise he made to Jacob in Genesis 28. He made it to the nation of Israel, Deuteronomy 31. He made it to Joshua, Joshua chapter 1, to Solomon, 1 Chronicles 28, and to many other saints in many other places of the Bible. And he makes the same promise to you and I if I belong to him. God will never withdraw his divine presence from those who are his. I will never leave you, he says. Nor will he withdraw his divine help. I will never forsake you. I can live my life as though he's not there, he's not helping me, and that's my choice. But, you know, God's batting a thousand when it comes to keeping his promises here in the Bible. And with that... I, as a believer, then, can boldly reply, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The quote here is from Psalm 118. And now what's interesting is that this exhortation comes here in the midst of this call to the duty of loving my brothers and sisters in Christ. It's encouraging me to be bold in my sacrificial love for those around me. When my contentment, my security relationally is being derived from my relationship with my Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ, when the Lord is everything to me, I won't be hesitant, I won't be afraid to stick my neck out, so to speak, relationally to another brother or sister. The Lord being my helper, I don't fear because what can man do to me? Now, see, this can be hard when people have been hurt relationally in the past. And they're like, you know, I'll only open up so far. I'll only go so deep in my relationship because I don't want to experience rejection or heartache. So relationships then remain shallow. But see, if I'm not looking to the other person to begin with for my blessings in my life because I'm receiving those from God, then I can boldly love others unconditionally. The Lord is my helper, not that other person. 
When I live my life that way, I will experience greater and deeper fellowship with my Lord Jesus Christ because he is the epitome of that. He came to this earth to lay his life down sacrificially for people who hated him, for his enemies. I wasn't exactly his friend when he extended his unconditional love to me. The Lord has loved me unconditionally, and he has instilled in me the ability to do the same. He will always be there. He will give me the power through his Holy Spirit. And when I do, he and I become closer and closer and closer, not because he's so far away from me, but because I'm far from him when I'm not doing that. It's very freeing to love just for the sake of loving, not expecting anything in return. And doing so for others opens levels of relationships with my Savior I will never know otherwise. That is a prominent New Testament doctrine. If I am going to be shallow with other believers, I will be shallow with Jesus. Beloved, let us not love one another. Let, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. For God is love, 1 John 4, 7, and 8. So I can walk in the log and I see a scorpion stuck on a log in a pond of water. So I get a stick and I try to save it the whole time. The scorpion's trying to sting the stick that I'm reaching out to save it with. And somebody walks up, they're like, dude, what are you doing? That's a scorpion. All it knows how to do is sting. That's its nature. You're wasting your time. Well, I say, you know, that may be, but it's my nature to save, to try and help. Do I have to change my nature because that poor creature won't change its nature? God is love, 1 John 4, 7. That is his nature. If I am born of God, that will be my nature too. When my fulfillment in life is not being derived or trying to be derived from something other than my relationship with the Lord... When I am a recipient of his divine, unconditional love, I'm set free to love others. His perfect love casts out fear, it says. I can have total boldness in my love for my brothers and sisters. And with the first six verses, they pertain to social, interpersonal relationships. The following verses deal with relationships within Christian ministry. First, with regards to church leadership, in particular those who have died, having set a good example. In verse 7, remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Now, this verse is in past tense, and so it's literally, remember those who have led you, as in the past who have spoken the word of God to you. It is believed that in the context the writer is speaking of here, he's, he's speaking of martyred saints such as Stephen, the other apostles who have been put to death for their faith in Jesus Christ. This would be a powerful reminder for those considering a return to Judaism. Don't forget those who gave their lives on your behalf who gave everything to see that you were taken care of spiritually. Don't forget that. See, there in the first century, the outcome, as it says in verse 7, the outcome of many of those who were teaching the word of God, living that out boldly there in Jerusalem, the outcome of their conduct was persecution unto death. That was the result of such an uncompromising, courageous life. Many first century believers lived their lives seeking to reach people who hated them so much they killed them. It's a life following the example of Jesus himself, in other words. And such a bold stand for the gospel like that is the ultimate witness for Jesus Christ. It's why the writer adds this declaration in verse 8, Jesus Christ, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus, who endured the same earthly fate, he lives on, so to speak, in the lives of those who are willing to be put to death at the hands of those who are trying to save, just as he did. Now, there are those in this world who are called martyrs of certain world religions, who sacrificed their lives by killing the infidels. 
they blow themselves up or they crash a plane into buildings or whatever other means of suicide they're doing so so as to kill innocent people whom they have been trained to hate and to achieve the highest level of their false heaven you compare that to the outcome of the conduct as it says here in verse 7 of christian martyrs of whom there have been millions you know, read fox's book of martyrs a christian martyr goes to their death out of love for the people who hate them demonstrating the most supreme act of sacrificial love following the example of our leader lord jesus christ those persecuting them to death they see the reality not just of the martyr's devotion to christ but they see his persecutors they see christ's devotion to them through this christian martyr they see that jesus and his followers would offer the most supreme sacrificial act to reach them to save them and that has been the greatest incentive for conversion throughout the church age it still is you see the movie beyond gates of splendor documents a conversion of Aka indians who murdered jim elliott and four other men and then their wives went back and preached the gospel to them again there's all these people and the whole tribe gets saved you know what i mean that has gone on throughout the church age it's the ultimate testimony here on earth of our lord who lives forever same yesterday today forever now he presently is in the heavenly realm but his followers are here on earth and thus verse 9 says do not be carried about with various strange doctrines for it is good that the heart be established by grace not with foods which have not profited those who have been not who have been occupied with them so already legalistic practices had entered the church there in Jerusalem. It's like uh, the first step backwards towards Judaism, just start introducing legalism. Believers were beginning to compromise the righteousness that had been bought for them on the cross through the Lord's sacrifice, already entering into legalism and teachings of legalism that advocated eating certain foods or not eating foods or dressing a certain way, not dressing a certain way, advocating those types of things to be holy or making someone holy. Anytime you know, those doctrines enter in, they end up diminishing the sufficiency of our Lord Jesus Christ to be carried about as it says there in verse 9, to be carried about is a word that speaks of unstableness, of any teaching or practice that purports to establish me spiritually on anything other than my faith in God's grace, as taught in the Word. You know, I'm always wary when I see someone's new book, or some new person, you know, on TV or on the internet or whatever, their new methodology for Christian living is being promoted above the Bible. And you got to get their book, dude. You got to get the prayer of Jabez, dude. You got to get the purpose driven. You got to get, you know, I, go, I love going to used bookstores, but it's sad. You go to the back where the, all the used book bins are, and there you see prayer of Jabez, dude, and the purpose driven for 50 cents. They can't give them away. But see, the newest book is right out in front, you know, <laughs> Twenty dollars, and you too, you know, can ex can experience new heights previously unknown in your spiritual journey, right up there, dude. And people fall for it and they buy it. And you know, why bother? I got the Bible. <laughs> no, it is good. Verse nine says, as in it is the right way, that the heart be established by grace, not with foods. The good or proper way to mature in my Christian walk is by allowing God to establish me spiritually by his grace rather than seeking to establish myself through some external means like what I eat or don't eat or how I dress or don't dress. Those who have occupied themselves, verse 9, with such legalistic practices have not been profited spiritually. A return to Judaism would be a return to a legalistic approach to God through religious practices. The writer here, he says to these fellow believers in verse 10, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. That's a really great passage he breaks into right here. 
But the altar was the first step in a Jewish person's approach to God. The offering of an animal sacrifice. As Christians, we have a totally different approach to God through the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. The writer is pointing out to these Jewish Christians that you can't have it both ways. You can't approach God through the bronze altar in front of the tabernacle or the temple at that time and still have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ and his sacrificial death on the cross. That fulfilled, his death fulfilled that whole sacrificial system under the old covenant. Because that is our altar, he's saying. And he gets very specific here in verse 11. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered outside the gate. Now, as Jewish readers, they would be completely familiar with what is being alluded to here. The ultimate Jewish sacrifice that symbolized the complete removal of sin under the Old Covenant, it took place on what is called Yom Kippur. The highest holy day on the Jewish calendar, the Day of Atonement, and their ultimate sacrifice of atonement on that day, a washing away sins. The ultimate sacrifice on the highest holy day was forbidden to be eat by, eaten by anyone including the high priest. The high priest would offer the blood of that sacrifice before God in the sanctuary, verse 11, or the Holy of Holies, and then he would take the whole animal, that whole slaughtered animal, that sacred sacrifice outside the Jewish camp and burn it there. He wouldn't burn it on the bronze altar. A totally different procedure from every other day of the year. Leviticus 16.27 puts it like this, the bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, there on Yom Kippur, their blood was to be brought in to make an atonement in the Holy of Holies, but the animal's bodies were to be carried outside the camp, and they shall burn in the fire their skins, their flesh, and their internal organs. Burn the whole thing completely, in other words. No one eats of it, no one partakes of that. The most sacred sacrifice on the most sacred day, no one could partake of it. The Yom Kippur holy sacrifice was not burned on the bronze altar like every other sacrifice, nor was any part eaten. Everything was taken outside the camp, burned there. Taking it outside the camp and burning it there was symbolic of the removal of all sin completely from the camp. Not even the high priest could partake or eat of it on that high day. But see, as believers, we can and we do partake of our Lord's sacrificial offering, his death on the cross that fulfilled what that highest holy day sacrifice symbolized. Non-Christian Jews there in Jerusalem, there in the first century, were still practicing the symbolism. The symbolism that forbid them from partaking of the only sacrifice that symbolized the removal of sin from their camp. Jesus fulfilled the symbolism of that sacrifice. He fulfilled the removal of sin. And those who partake of his sacrifice have in reality now our sins removed forever. And we have access to God opened for us. That is a reality that was manifested by the veil in the temple being torn apart when our Lord cried to tell us die or is finished. For someone to go back to the symbolism would be to go back to being forbidden to have access to God in a relational way. Jesus, verse 12, says that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, that he might make them holy so as to have full access to God. He suffered outside the gate. They would get this immediately. The Lord was crucified outside the city gates of Jerusalem in order to complete that typology, complete what that highest sacrificial offering for the removal of sins symbolized. In order to, to complete what that symbolism was, he, could, he would have to be crucified outside the gates of Jerusalem, which he was, if it was to be accurate. And that's where he was crucified. Therefore, 
the writer says in verse 13, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. This is a writer's final call for these Jewish Christians to make a clean break with Judaism once and for all. If they're going to follow Jesus, it would require a full departure from the camp of Judaism. And it would involve reproach from their Jewish families and friends for doing so. Just as a full-on commitment to Jesus Christ for many of us has involved reproach from unsafe family and unsafe friends. But such reproach is only temporary, he reminds them. In verse 14, for here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. He's alluding back to his reference to the heavenly city back in chapter 12, Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, chapter 12, verse 22. As was pointed out there last time in chapter 12 as a believer, the New Testament declares multiple times that my citizenship is in heaven already. That is where my homeland is. I don't have a homeland on this earth. I don't set up little flags in my yard and this is who I am. You know, my flag is heaven. That's where I live, man. That's where my citizenship is. I'm simply passing through. There's no continuing city, as verse 14 says, here on earth for me. For the Jewish believers who first received this epistle, that would literally take place in a few years. When Jesus, when he was on earth, three times he prophesied of the coming destruction of Jerusalem. That these people are not going to have a continuing city anyway here on earth. Matthew 24, Luke 19, Luke 21. Jesus said the city would come under siege. It would be completely destroyed. Not one stone would be left upon another at the temple. All of it came to pass. So he's in encouraging them, let us follow the Lord outside the camp of Judaism, the writer's saying. We have no lasting habitation here on earth, no continuing city. We seek the one to come. Now he tells them that the sacrifices we offer as believers are not animal sacrifices. Having had our sins washed away, we offer different kinds of sacrifices. We pointed out in verse 15. Therefore by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share with such sacrifices. God is well pleased. You want to please God? Here you go, dude. Here's the sacrifices he desires. Verse 15 is literally, literally, therefore, through him, through our eternal high priest. It's the only acceptable approach to God. I can't come on my own or my own way. I come through Jesus Christ. What is to be offered is the continual sacrifice of praise to God. I, again, it's easy to praise God when everything's going good. It's easy to praise him when it's convenient. Oh, you know, as long as it fits into my schedule. But that is not the sacrifice of praise that is pleasing to God. It's, it's being spoken of here. Not that I shouldn't praise God when everything's going good. But the sacrifices that honor God are those that are costly. David said, you know, when, when he offered to buy, you know, the threshing floor of Aruna, and he, Aruna said, here, take everything. You can have it for free. He said, I'm not going to offer to God something that doesn't cost me anything. That's not a sacrifice or an offering at all. Doing so, even though it may be inconvenient, even though it's a sacrifice, I don't feel good or I had a bad day. When I offer him genuine praise, then that gives great honor and true praise to God. As one theologian said, it's not sufficient to feel adoring emotions when uttering praise to God. Because true praise is not for me. It's not about what makes me feel good. True praise is to exalt God regardless of the state I am in. That is when my lips, as it says here, are bearing fruit to God when genuine thanks are being offered to his name. Not when it feels good to me or it's convenient to me and it makes me good, feel good, you know. I'm giving thanks for who he is to his name. But such sacrifices that I'm to offer as a believer are not just confined to verbal 
proclamations, but don't be forgetful to do good, verse 16. It speaks of acts of benevolence, being kind and showing compassion to others. Again, not just when I feel like it or when it's convenient, but when the need is presented right there before me, regardless of how I feel when it's sacrificial. It's a pleasing to God. To share, verse 16, means sacrificial giving, helping meet the needs of others less fortunate than myself. Then in the context here, another form of Christian sacrifice, verse 17, obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy, not with grief, for that would be unprofitable to you. A true biblical church is a unique entity within society when you think about it. Nobody's forcing anyone to be here. Now, some parents got to force their kids to come. I get that because they're rebellious. But it's not like someone comes to your door, may a Jehovah Witnesses, you know, but it's not like the government shows up. You have to be at this certain location at this time Sunday morning. You got to sing these songs and listen to this guy talk once a week or we're going to fine you. We're going to put you in jail. This is totally voluntary as is true submission to those entrusted with overseeing an institution like this. And it's amazing how many people over the years have come to church and act like, just, or sometimes just outright say, well, I don't care what you think. You know, I don't care whatever, you, what, I'll do whatever I want to do. That's very common, actually. There's always people I don't even pay attention while you're teaching the Bible study. It makes you think, too, why are you even here? You know, why <laughs> Starbucks closed or something, you know? You look around at prayer time sometime. Myself or Brian will say, okay, we're going to have everybody pray at the same time. Dude, this has been a, several years of trying to bring this together. Have the church body be in one accord. Prayer time starts. And, and as it starts, you know, you look around, there's a group here, there's a group there. They just start socializing. Fifteen minutes later, you know, if you come up and say, dude, we're trying to, like, have prayer together, people get offended. People have left this church because I talked to them for that reason. Calling me mean and unsensitive and how can you do that? Get totally offended. Who are you? Who do you think you are? I can do whatever I want, which is absolutely true. You can do whatever you want. You think about it. That's why submission is a sacrifice. If we were in a class at MATC and the instructor said, okay, for this part of the class, we're going to do this certain activity. And if someone just ignored them and did their own thing there, you'd think, dude, how rude that person is. You know, that person's so disruptive. But see, it's not like that in church. That's why verses like this are included in the New Testament. To obey means to give assent to, submit to those that the Lord has put in position of spiritual leadership over his church. I'm not the leader, Jesus is. You just think naturally, as in any other segment of society, well, these people are leading this. I should obey and submit to their authority. But see, as you know, as well as I know, we live in a society where the police, the authority, are the bad guys now. And the bad guys are the victims. And we need to defund the police and give more money to the criminals. Dude, it's crazy. But that's the society we live in. That mentality is in the church as well. If Brian or I, if we, as those who must give an account, as it says in verse 17, if we correct someone, as we're called to, and exercise pastoral authority, it's amazing how many times we're seen as the bad guys. But you can't defund us because we don't ask for money. <laughs> According to the writer here, for someone to ignore or undermine church authority, they're only hurting themselves. It doesn't hurt me. It can give me grief, as it says, but I lay all my grief at the foot of the cross. Jesus, this person in your church, <laughs> you have me pastoring, is giving me a lot of grief when I give such grief to him he as he always promises to do he exchanges that grief for joy all the time he said just remember Jeff it could be worse 
you could be that person. That's true, Lord. You know, that's true. Now, the writer closes out his epistle first with personal prayer request. Verse 18. Pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things desiring to live honorably. But I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now, you'd think, wow, somebody who could write an amazing epistle like this probably doesn't need prayer when in reality they need prayer more than anybody else for them to say for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things that means they were under a lot of attack under false accusations slanders disparaging of their character that's how satan attacks those who are in leadership position he attacks their integrity and their character you lose that then you got nothing he stirs up people to spread its false accusations. Pray for us, he says, in the face of such hostility, because we have a good conscience, he says. But it doesn't mean it still doesn't hurt. So pray for us. He asks for a prayer that him and his companions would be restored to fellowship with them soon. And then he adds his benediction, verse 20. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So after asking the readers to pray for him, the writer here adds a prayer for them by way of a formal blessing. And this prayer encapsulates in one verse here, verse 20, the whole theology of God's provision of divine grace for fallen humanity. It's pretty amazing. And he only expounded on it for 12 chapters. Now he condenses it down one verse. The, f the fact that grace is extended to us in the first place is because God is a God of peace. He desires a relationship with us, not animosity. And thus he has reconciled us to himself through the death and resurrection of his only begotten son, our Lord Jesus, who was brought up from the dead. With that resurrection of his confirmed God's satisfaction with his sacrifice that, was put, that has put away our sins forever and has secured Jesus as the great shepherd of the sheep, it says. Jesus said in John 10, my sheep hear my voice and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. The relationship that has been made possible through the blood of the everlasting covenant, verse 20. May the God who has provided that everlasting covenant, may he by his divine power make the believers complete, he prays, in every good work to do his will, so the prayer is for God's divine power to be provided for believers so they can do God's will. That's a good prayer to pray. I need God's power to do his will. And then to be pleasing in his sight, verse 21, all through the agency or intermediary role of Jesus Christ, thus causing all glory to be attributed to him alone where it belongs. Amen. And quite an exorbitant way to say goodbye. And then verse 22, And I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of exhortation, for I have written to you in few words. Know that our brother Timothy has been set free, with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. Greet all those who rule over you and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. Grace be with you all. Amen. Well, there's no autograph on this epistle. But many believe the Apostle Paul may have wrote it. And with such a lengthy farewell, you know, it could very well be because that's how he ends his epistles. He can't shut up, you know. Oh, one last thing, you know. Please bear with me this word of exhortation. He says there in verse 22, appeal, you know, just bear with this word of exhortation written in a few words. I hate to see what a lengthy epistle would be by this guy, you know. And the thing is, I received this epistle in the spirit in which it was sent, in other words. Not to condemn, but to encourage. And thus he ends with these few personal notes. 
that don't really have bearing on the rest of the epistle, except when he says at the end, grace be with you all. Amen. Now, as I shared before, according to several historians, it seems that the Jewish believers who received this were persuaded by this letter to hold fast to their faith in Jesus Christ. Because within two years of receiving this, the first Jewish revolt took place there in Jerusalem against Roman authorities in AD 66. When, the, when that revolt began, the entire Hebrew Christian community, 20,000 of them in Jerusalem alone, but all Jewish Christians in Jerusalem surrounding area, they all fled the country and they relocated to a city called Pella on the east side of the Jordan River. As a result, the Jewish revolt, they're going to take on Rome and they're going to conquer Rome by themselves. That revolt, which had the Jewish Christian, had they reverted back to Judaism, they would have been a part of it. But due to the revolt, Rome sent a large army under General Titus to stop the Jews. They besieged the city of Jerusalem, starved the people out. They were crucifying over 500 Jews a day. They were crucifying several, several of them on, a, on one cross at a time. It's horrible when you read about the historical account. The Romans ended up killing over a million Jews. They destroyed the city. The whole temple was leveled. And the sacrificial system that these people wanted to revert back to was brought to an end for close to 2,000 years now. It's amazing to read the news and see it being resurrected because there will be a temple during the tribulation period. And you can go to the Temple Institute and see everything's ready for that to be put together. But at that time, not one Jewish Christian lost their life because they heeded the encouragement of this, this epistle. They stand as an incredible witness for us. Thank you, Lord, that this epistle was written and that it was preserved for our learning, Lord, so that we can know you more, serve you better, bow before your majesty, God. I pray that you would give us that grace to serve you, Lord, with a, a, all our hearts in a way that is acceptable to you and that honors you, Lord. We love you, Jesus take full reins of your church, stand as our high priest, our pastor, our brother, and the one that we adore and worship. In your name we pray, amen.